You're listening to Financial Advisor Marketing, the best show on the planet for financial advisors who want to get more clients without all the stress. You're about to get the real scoop on everything from lead generation to closing the deal. James is the founder of TheAdvisorCoach.com, where you can find an entire suite of products designed to help financial advisors grow their businesses more rapidly than ever before. Now, here is your host, James Pollard. Financial advisors, welcome to another episode of the Financial Advisor Marketing Podcast. I have been on a roll with these guest episodes. Recently, they have been straight fire because people are talking to me and you, by extension, about things that haven't really been discussed on the Financial Advisor Marketing Podcast. YouTube marketing, Instagram marketing is coming up in a few weeks. There's just different topics that I haven't talked about. Gen Z, Today, we're going to talk about Twitter marketing. It's amazing because we're 220 plus episodes deep and I haven't really brought up Twitter at all because I, even though I have a Twitter account, I'm rarely on it for reasons I think we'll discuss in the podcast episode, uh, except for advertising purposes. But Thomas Kopelman is on Twitter and he is absolutely crushing it. We're going to talk about how he's using Twitter for his business, the benefits he's seen from it, and some other cool stories along the way. So Thomas, thank you so much for being here. Yeah, man, I'm happy to be back. And I think it'll be cool to talk about like since the last time I've on and and what I really taught about, I've made a complete shift and how it's been significant and a significant change for our business, the clients we bring in, the type of clients we bring in, the revenue we bring in. It's it's been really cool to see. So for people who don't know you, what is your business? Who do you serve? And what is a little bit of your background? Yeah, so I'm the co-founder of All Street Wealth. We are uh we've actually kind of like shifted over the years, right? Like I mean, when I first began as a financial planner, my thought was I'll work with young people, you know, hopefully people that make six figures, maybe they'll be like dual income households. And that totally shifted to now like who I found I do the best work for and who I attract the most is still millennials, still young people in that that phase of life, but almost mostly business owners. And then I have probably like 25% of the people that are coming in are like, hey, I work in tech, I have equity comp, we're making a lot of money, and we just need like help on figuring out how to manage our whole financial life. That's awesome. And we're going to talk about Twitter marketing specifically, and we'll get into the marketing side of it and like the content that you put out. But I want to ask you, do you curate your content at all? And if so, how? Just by like who I follow? Like like your feed, yeah. Because one of the things that worries me is that social media is a wonderful servant, but it is a terrible master. And there was a period of my life where I started studying like how social media feeds work and how the algorithms work and like Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn. So I want to be clear, it's not just Twitter, but these social media feeds, I mean, they're called feeds for a reason. They're designed to elicit a reaction from you to get you to like, to comment. And unfortunately, what I have noticed or based on the research that I've read about Twitter is that it's it's designed to get you to be angry, to be outraged. And that's one of the reasons why I'm not on it. So I'm just curious, like when you go to your social media feed, like how have you curated the feed itself to give you what you want? Yeah. I think it's funny. I saw somebody tweet yesterday that if you're somebody with thousands of followers and you have, and you follow less than a thousand people, you're a dick. Like that was the exact tweet he said. And I'm like, you couldn't be farther from the truth. Like I definitely see what you're talking about. And I think there's pockets of that, but I also like my feed seems super positive. Like I'm not following news sources. Like the people who I follow are my friends. I follow financial planners I can learn from. Like I I have so, so many financial planners that follow me. If I don't feel like they're creating content that's educating me, not not going to be a follow. I also don't want my whole feed to be finance. Like that's my world. That's what I talk about. Like I don't really need that, but I think there's other people worth following that I truly can learn from. And then I follow people in other areas that interest me, like health and fitness is one, like growing a business. Like I follow people who are like professionals in, in real estate and in all these areas where I, I use Twitter to learn. And the reason why, so I go back like a couple of years, I, I started using Twitter and I had an advisor reach out to me and say like, dude, you're using Twitter wrong. You're talking way too much about personal finance. Nobody's going to want to follow you. Twitter is meant to network with advisors. And I was like, nah, I think you're wrong. Like you're, you're 45 or 50 years old. You're trying to work with retirees. Like we have totally different goals. He's like, no, LinkedIn is where you should be. And I don't think that's true. I mean, LinkedIn really is a B2B platform and and like that was the goal out of it. And so I I just, I mean, I always use the example, like look at the comments, right? Like when I go post on LinkedIn, every comment on mine is good post, great thought, 
Like, I'll love that. Like, there's no real engagement there. It's all kind of just like, hopefully that helps you comment on mine, which hopefully helps it spread to another network. And hopefully that helps me get followers because I know I'm supposed to comment on five people a day. Like those rules. And, and it's so fake. You see it's so fake. You go to Twitter, nobody comments that, right? Like if I post about why I think, you know, real estate can be a great investment, but here's the downsides. Every comment is going deeper into the conversation. You either don't comment, it goes deeper in the conversation. And then you have the pocket of people who try to argue with you and they like try to demean who you are. Like somebody tried to pull my, like go check my CRD number and say, I only have one year of experience, which is not true. And so I just block those people. Like anybody who's going to be a negative suck on my life and not add any value, I block. I mean, actually, I mute. I don't block because I think that gives them satisfaction. I just mute so I never see them. But I think Twitter is truly where you go to learn. Like, I go to learn there. And if I'm trying to attract young, successful people like myself, I would say, in this situation, that's where I think that they're going to live. And so, like, in January of last year, I said, let's test this. Like, let's let's live on Twitter and use Twitter as my channel. And so I was like, I'm going to start in January and I'm going to do a thread every single day for 31 days. And I'm going to see how that goes. And I was at maybe like somewhere between 800 and a thousand followers to start last January, started with a thread a day, you know, that started to pick up, do better. I started to be like, okay, I'm going to schedule out a tweet every day. And then throughout the year, I was like, I've always heard only focus on quality. Quantity does not matter. You need quality and quantity can destroy you. And I was like, well, I don't know if that's true. Like if I'm always putting out good content, like it doesn't have to be Morgan Housel type blog posts and things like that, but good, helpful, short form content for people. I think that's going to help me. So then I started to escalate it to schedule three a day, every single day. And then I post anytime thoughts come to my head. Hey, I just had a client meeting. This was a really good thing. I talked to them about, let me go post about that. And I just do that over and over and over. And so like in, in that 12 months, I went from whatever, 800 to a thousand followers. So I'm almost at 8,000 now in 2022, I ended up doing last year, like almost 10 million impressions. And this year, this first, you know, in, in this first 20 days, I've done like 900,000 impressions, 700 new followers in that 20 days. And like, my thought really is like, if I think about the funnel and I think about how you get clients in this industry, I always talk about like, it's, it's not like I'm Nike and I put out this sweet new pair of shoes or this cool hoodie and people are like, dang, that's sick. I'm going to go buy it. Like that, that's not how it works with an advisor. How it works with an advisor is I'm nurturing people. I'm teaching them. I'm giving them free value. You know, maybe they see me talk about taxes and then equity comp and then this and then that. And then they go get a new job, right? They get a new job at Meta and they have all this equity comp and they have no idea what to do with it. And they're like, man, I've been following Thomas for a year and a half now. He's talked about all these things. He's the only financial planner I know that knows about this. He's never asked for me anything in return. I'm going to hit him up because I think he's going to be the one to help me. And so the more I'm in front of people, the more that they hear from me, the more that they see me, the, the more likely it is that I'm going to be the one they reach out to when they hit that pain point that they know I can solve. And so all I did was increase the amount of times I'm tweeting. And like last year, I almost brought on a client every single week. Some months, you know, like I, you know, December, I took two weeks off. Like that wasn't going to happen. Maybe one month I brought on three versus four. And I had almost a hundred prospects driven in from social media in that given time with a minimum fee of $450 a month working with millennials. So it's not like I'm a low ticket item thing that sure, I'll give this a try. Like in the last four months, my average prospect is making over half a million dollars a year in their thirties. Like those aren't easy to come by people. And all of that was driven solely from Twitter. Like I didn't drop LinkedIn, but all I do from LinkedIn is this tweet did well yesterday. That's going to be my post on LinkedIn, maybe edit it a little bit and change the form. But I probably spend 15 minutes a week on LinkedIn and all my time creating on Twitter. But like I schedule out almost two months at a time. So people think I spend all this time on Twitter, but I I really don't. Like I, I probably spend 90 minutes a week creating content. Like I, I don't know if anybody can argue that they can't find that amount of time. Do you go back and repurpose your content at all? Or not repurpose, but literally just repost the content. Yeah. So I'll actually, this will come out three months later, but I have a kids' post coming out uh, this month all about how I repurpose. Because what I do is I go analyze all my stuff that's done well. Because think about it, January, 1,000 followers, December, almost 8,000. 
how much of that audience has never seen any of my good posts? Right. So I always heard the statistic that 20% of people, of your followers will see each post, which is probably honestly not even true. Maybe it's less and maybe 1% remember. So my thought is I'm rewriting. Sometimes I edit it and redo it. Sometimes I repost the same thing. I also have it where like anything with over 20 retweets gets retweeted by me later throughout the year. And for me, like, I, I think that really works well. And the argument everybody has for me is like, well, what happens if that one person reaches out and is like, oh, you already posted that before. And I always say like, to me, I won. Like if, if that person who scrolls Twitter, LinkedIn, Instagram, Facebook every day remembers my post from one or two months ago, that post was killer. Like it was so good that it stayed in their mind that long that like I'm winning, like that is not a downside in any way. If I, I do see some financial advisors that post like the, like every week, they'll post a few of the same tweets. That's, I don't think that's good. I, I don't think that's the way to do it, but I think you can revisit, right? Because all we're trying to teach people is a lot of very similar principles in different ways to actually reinforce it in their mind so that they can learn. Well, I think re Posting and I guess repurposing. Repurposing, when I say repurposing financial advisors, what I mean is using the same content in a similar way, but not the exact same way. When I say reposting, I quite literally mean copy, paste, use the exact same thing. Both and of I those things, yeah, both of those things save time. So for advisors to say, I don't have time to post. Well, commit first. If you have 365 posts throughout an entire year, according to the 80-20 rule, 73 of them should generate 80% of your results. You're telling me you can't take those 73 posts and just copy, paste, put them right back in into the feed. Like that you would lock in your results. But people yeah. don't think that way. Yeah, I, I think I I really try to do both. So I try to repost the things that have done really well, right? Like you know, especially going from Twitter to LinkedIn, like that is an instant repost because that did well. So if I had seven tweets yesterday, what was the best one? That's what gets posted on LinkedIn because if it wins here, it's going to win here. Like that, that's what I've really found. But also like I write a blog post I on LinkedIn, I may, I write an intro and then I'll throw the blog post link there. Twitter, I turn it into a thread. So I'll edit it and make it, you know, the first part be really interesting because I think that's where a lot of advisors fail is that they don't ever try to grab attention. They just like, six ways to get ready for retirement. It's like, that's so boring. Nobody's going to read that. Like you have to hook them early on. So I spend that time there for sure. But I also go back, I go to old newsletters, I go to old blog posts and I, and I go find tweets from there that I can go schedule out. And then what I'm going to do in like a year or two, you know, maybe three, who knows what it'll look like is I'm going to have an unbelievable amount of content. Like I already have written a blog post every week for two and a half years. I write a newsletter every month. I do a podcast every week. I'm going to hire somebody to repurpose all of it. Like they're going to go to old podcasts. They're going to cut clips and repost it. They're going to go to old blogs and clean them up and write things about it. They're going to go old tweets and write about it. Like eventually I'm going to have, like, I don't think you can outsource marketing, especially in a service-based business when you're working with me most of the time, like content marketing specifically, until you've built that. Once Agreed. it's built- I 100%. think it, you can totally outsource it, but I don't think you can go hire somebody from day one and be like, go talk about this because th like what I'm attracting through this is people who really want to work with me and my beliefs and my personality. And if I don't create that through my content, I'm not going to attract anybody. Like, you know, my first job we had hearsay, which is like an auto, you know, platform that posts your stuff. I think you're better off not posting than doing that nine times out of 10, because it's, it's unrelatable. It's ununique. It's nothing about you. And all you're going to do is push people away from that. And that's an excellent point. I talk about outsourcing all the time. And I try to just explain to people, you can't multiply zeros. You're not going to wake up one day and say, okay, I have my LLC now. I just need to hire somebody to do everything for me. It's not, <laughs> that's not how it works. You have to hand off systems. And the, e even if we had a world where everyone had to outsource, okay, the person who put in the, in the effort to have the systems to hand off is still going to dominate. It's still going to crush you. So you you having that library of content is incredible. And that's one of my secrets, by the way, is uh, I do it through email though. So the emails that had the most results are the ones that I put on LinkedIn. What's interesting is that they don't get all the clicks and likes and comments and stuff, but they still get um, pretty good interaction. Speaking of that- yeah. I am curious. So you're you're talking about putting links to blog posts. Uh, one of the questions I have for you is I'm trying to think about the sequence. So when someone sees Thomas Kopelman and is, let's just say this person is in his mid thirties and makes $500,000 per year at a tech company or whatever, does that person go to your profile 
or does that person go to your website? Yeah. So my funnel from the way that I see it is Twitter to website to book a meeting. Like that, that's how it is. Like I don't cold DM anybody. I don't push anybody to meet with me. Like let, yesterday I had six new prospects book a meeting with me. All of them, either business owners or making above $500,000 a year, all of them at the right age range. Two of them have multi-million dollar windfalls coming in this year. And I never, I've never talked to them one time before. I've maybe engaged with them on Twitter. I've never DM them. I, I've never done anything along that boat. They just eventually like, I need to book a meeting with him. And when you click on like my Thomas Copelman dot card, whatever you have book a meeting and you have a website. I actually just had another prospect right now, just book a meeting through the same funnel. And so that's where like, I'm sure I'm missing out on some by not messaging, but part of my brand I think is, is not being a salesman. And I know content is sales, but I, I consider marketing and sales two different things. Like I, the world I started in was all sales, all number of leads, all pitch them, all these things, why you're the best. And, and when like, I want everybody to see through my content till the time they meet with me, that my approach is let me get to know you. Let me, let me tell you how we best work with people and what our process is. And if that's what you want, then we're here for you. But in no way am I convincing you to work with us. Am I going to sit here and like say, hey, this advisor does this. I do this, do this. I'm just going to tell you what I do. And if that's what you want, then then come work with us. And, and I keep it that simple. And so I don't try to push anybody there. I've just found the natural funnel is they want to work with me. They check me out. Some people go look at pricing. Some people just book the meeting right away. I wish more advisors understood that. So you you demonstrate tremendous anti-neediness where you don't need the business. You know there's always another one coming. You don't need the client. In fact, the client needs you. I mean, that's really the mental state that I think you need to be in. But, but I think that confidence, the, the confidence that clients see in that first meeting or prospects of they don't need me, they're not going to just be all things to me. They're not going to convince me of this. Like that's that attracts them to want to work with you. Absolutely. Do you use a tracking software at all to know like which links specifically people come from? No. I think you should. Hyros, <laughs> a company called Hyros, actually, I think it was yesterday or two days ago, just released an organic tracking part of the business. It used to be all ads tracking and like YouTube and Google and Facebook and Twitter, but now they have an organic part of their business. I think that could be extremely helpful, especially if you put link A in one thread, link B in another thread, link C. Because but I don't put any links and threads. So that that's my thing is like, I, I don't drive anybody off platform from any content. Like it's literally that they just are like, hey, I want to book a meeting with him. They're going to click my profile oh. and then it's going to draw them to our scheduler. Like okay. I, I don't have like, even on my blog post at the bottom, like I used to have like, if you want to work with me, here's a link to book with me. And, you know, maybe I'm I'm missing and I'm maybe missing some prospects, but like, I mean, I, I'm normally booked out two to three months with a household a week that like, it's more than enough that sometimes I'm sure there's ways to optimize, but it's kind of like, you know, am I actually going to go analyze and track these numbers or not? Okay. Yeah. That's what I was curious about. Was it, if you have any links, like if you're posting in threads versus them going to the profile, well, let's bring up, do you know off the top of your head, what your profile says? Like, how do you describe yourself on your profile? Um, no, but the one thing it. I'll, the one thing that I'll add to what that you were just, wait, what, did, what was the point you just made right before this? about organic tracking, like tracking the links organically. Cause I, I thought this whole time that you were putting links in like threads, like you were saying. Oh no. Yeah. That's what I was going to talk about is Twitter hates links. Like ev anything. I, the only time I ever throw a link is for my podcast. So people will go like, I'll throw the video. I, I always throw a highlight video. I'm not just gonna throw a link to my podcast. I'm gonna throw a video to try to get them interested. And then I'll drop a link underneath there. But like my blog posts, I just write as a thread. I have no link to my blog. Like mm. I would say 99.9% .9 of my posts have no links to it because I don't want the demotion. I think I'm going to actually try that. And I will give you credit, everyone on the podcast here. If I, if you see me start doing threads and do, do that approach, all credit goes to Thomas. So I, his, and I his, think it's worth, people hate on threads because people throw out garbage, fake threads. Like if you are going to actually yeah. post a thread that's valuable, then it is, there's no better way to do it because you get long form native content that people don't have to hop off the platform for. And I put one out yesterday. Like I, I was like, I, I had a blog post idea for this week. I was like, I don't have time to write this long one. I'm gonna do something easy. So I did one literally on how much house and car can I afford? And mm. I, put, I turned that into a thread and it has 30,000 views. 
It has 79 likes, 29 retweets, 11 comments, and 30,000 views. And something that the blog post took me 15 minutes, and then it took me five minutes to put into a thread and probably 15 minutes to write the first part of the thread. And does the blog post also do well, like by itself? Is that one of your top performing blog posts or? No, no. Like I, I don't even expect people to go to my blog. I just know that I actually use my blog. I, I, in the beginning thought people would, and I still get like maybe, you know, a thousand readers a month. Like, it's not like it's bad by any means, but the way that I have it is that it's so hard to go find old threads. So when a client or somebody's talking to me about like, Hey, I remember you had a post about this. I can just send them to my blog for easy finding. And then it's also like a, a native, a place where people go like, look at who I am. Like they can see all the content I've ever posted because search on social is bad. It's just really bad. And so that solves more problems, but doesn't take any work because either way, I'm going to have to go write it out somewhere. That's, that's a good point too. You just, that's another example of repurposing. And I want to walk people through what your profile says. So if you want to just read it off real quick, you can go ahead. Yeah. So mine says co-founder, all street wealth, helping equity compensate millennials and entrepreneurs build wealth. Top 100 advisor by Investopedia, tweets are not advice. And and I've worked with that a lot because I used to have to be really wordy and I needed it to say blog or podcast or all these things. I realized like, you know, there's certain things that don't need to be in it. I just want people to go there and say like, oh, I'm an equity compensated employee or I'm an entrepreneur. And then obviously top 100 advisor by Investopedia, like people can argue about all of those things all the time, but it's not like I paid for that. Like you get voted into that. I got it. It's, It's a stamp of approval. Like all content and branding and everything is, is like, are you a vetted person? And can you initially build trust to make people want to work with you? All of those things do that. Your header also has similar credibility mechanisms. So your header is like top 100 advisor by Investopedia, top 23 millennial financial planner by Business Insider. So your your profile is a masterclass in and of itself. It's just that you can see that you are credible, that you're competent, and people can immediately start scrolling down and just start viewing your content. That's one of the things I like about Twitter, and that's one of the regrets that I have about not using it so much, is that people can just start scrolling directly from your profile. They don't have to click other links like they would have to do on Facebook to watch video or on LinkedIn to get to all of your post and activity. So that is one of the regrets I have. Not yeah, using but I think them. that like somebody like you who already has a following, like cross going platforms is a, is an easier build than ever building platform number one. Like, even though you can't be like on LinkedIn, if you say, go follow me on Twitter, your post is going to get like 400 views. Like well, you totally get that. But then as you start to build here, more people are like, Oh, I remember him from LinkedIn. Why would I not follow him here? But like, I mean, LinkedIn was my main focus. I I think on LinkedIn, I don't know how many followers, maybe I have like 5,500 followers. Now I was at like 47 or 4,800 when I was at 800 on here. Like there's no arguing that like being found Twitter is the easiest besides TikTok, like Twitter is the easiest one to grow because of retweets, because of comments, like all of those things get pushed out. Like, and it's really easy to click, go to the profile and hit come, like hit follow. Then LinkedIn, do I hit connect? Do I send them an email? Do I do this? Like the friction is so much more in every other platform than Twitter. Hey, financial advisors, if you'd like even more help building your business, I invite you to subscribe to James's monthly paper and ink newsletter, The James Pollard Inner Circle. When you join today, you'll get more than $1,000 worth of bonuses, including exclusive interviews that aren't available anywhere else. Head on over to theadvisorcoach.com slash coaching to learn more. One of the things I'm curious about, because you're talking about posting like three times a day and scheduling out and just being consistent, and that is a great thing that financial advisors can take away. But do you know or remember if there was any catalyst, like a viral tweet that you had that just went to the moon and back? Like just so, a huge tweet. So I've had some tweets that have like hundreds of thousands in the hundred thousands of impressions. And uh Brendan Fraser actually found this website where you can analyze people's profiles and he analyzed mine. And my top five tweets were all one line long. That's cool. That's kind of yeah, the thing like that I'm I, getting at. I had one the other day that was like, I I bonds are not your path to wealth. And I think it maybe has like 50,000 plus impressions. Like, I just think the one thing you learn real quick with content, like this thread I was just telling you about from this week, I expected to get nothing out of it. I just wanted to make sure I got content out there because that's most important. And it blows up. And almost everything of mine that's ever blown up has been the thing I thought I just barely put any effort into. So that's why I just never like the Carl Richards idea of like, 
you, I've fired you from the job of determining whether what you're, you think you're going to say is valuable or not. I've really taken that to heart and be like, I don't, sometimes you don't know what's valuable as, as your knowledge base grows significantly. Sometimes you forget these things people have no idea about can be super valuable. I've noticed that a lot <laughs> in my own life, just putting things out there. I used to have a personal Twitter account and I deleted it because of the social media stuff that I was researching. I was like, I got to get this out of my life. I was like, I'll have the business one. The The account I have now was actually just the advisor coach business page. And I was like, that's dumb. I got to put my face on there. What I used to do that worked well, I used a lot of current events. So like NBA finals, Super Bowl, WrestleMania, like the the Oscars. Do you do any of that? Like, do you capitalize on current events at all? So not really, because not that I think that's wrong, but I think that there's multiple different goals of how to use social. Like I I know a lot of people who they'll talk about anything spammy, anything on headlines, because that gets them followers. But at the end of the day, the name of the game really isn't followers to me. It's the right type of audience. And so like, you know, I get advisors reach out to me all the time. Like, Hey, I got this awesome opportunity, this account with 400,000 followers. They're going to retweet one of my tweets every day and I'm going to grow. I'll get 6,000 followers as quick. And I'm like, what you understand is they, that's their job. They're doing this for so many other people that all of the people that follow you are kind of under this umbrella that that doesn't make them any more qualified. Like, because the only way I'm getting followers is because they see my content and want to follow me. I'm nurturing an audience of people who are either going to learn, they're going to learn from me in multiple ways. There's the DIYers who are never going to be my clients, but are going to learn. And I'm going to have a course that I can sell to them because they still want to learn. They just don't think they need an advisor. Then I have the people who are DIYers, but need help. And they're going to be one-time financial plan clients. And then I have the delegators that are going to follow me and and never read it, never understand it, but they're going to know the topic and they're going to reach out to me for that. So I'll be, have a way to sell to each different type of person in my audience but basically all of them fit the type of person who exactly who I'm creating towards. That's a pretty smart way to like silo your business. That's, I think that's a good way to structure it because you know the different types of people who are following you. Like like you said, people who are delegators versus people who are DIYers who just want a course. Uh, I think course creation is a tremendous opportunity for financial advisors. Uh, there are two advisors out of uh, Tennessee that have a podcast. I'm not really the name drop guy. Any anybody who's in the space listens to the podcast. They know they have a course that they sell that is incredible, and I think it's incredibly well done. And I just I appreciate that you're chasing that opportunity too. Well, I think I think it's a no brainer. I think it's a way to add more impact to help more people because there's just so much bad knowledge out there. But like even beyond that, what I've come like I, I've analyzed my who follows me, who consumes my content, and LinkedIn is advisors. Like I go look at who consumes my content. It's like vast majority of advisors. So this year, I mean, I'm on your podcast. I'm on a few other ones. I'm probably speaking at Jolt, Kitz's blog coming out on advisors. I'm probably going to turn LinkedIn channel into be selling to advisors because the plan is I'm I'm in the works right now of building a, a, a content, like how to, not all marketing, but solely how to use social media marketing to grow a business. And the goal is at some point of this year, Samantha Russell and I will have that out. And so then I'll turn that channel because I don't want Twitter. I don't want to convolute things. Like I, I want one mission, one goal on Twitter, and then I can use LinkedIn as another goal. Kind of almost how Cody Garrett's pivoted to do it. Like most of his talk on LinkedIn is about the things that he's putting out there for advisors, because that's where advisors live. But that's also why I don't focus there to grow my client base because that's where advisors live. Yeah, and it is kind of sad to see people share something that is intended for clients, and they say like comment this word if you want it and advisors are like, gimme, 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 gimme. It's like, no, that's not the intended audience. Go away. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. That's what they want. They all just come out of the woodwork. You have a good point though, that there are a lot of advisors on there and Cody Garrett does awesome work. By the time this podcast comes out, he should have his course or program or system out about um, creating a financial plan. I want to be the first customer for that. I don't know if I'm going to be the first customer, but we'll see. I'm buying it because I I have a full-time hire coming on this year who he has a tax background. He does like tax planning and tax filing for businesses. And he has a financial planning side to learn. So like in the first six months, that's going to be his like deep learning because maybe there's things that we're not doing that we could learn. He can learn there. And then we're going to have all of these. I mean, in six months, I'll probably have at least 20 clients we'll bring on. So he's going to get so much repetition to learn that planning side that like, to me, there's not really a good, here's how you learn about financial planning. Cause like most firms don't even know how to teach it. 
Yeah. And finan- yeah, financial advisors can't really train that well. And the ones who need the most help are the ones who say, I don't have time. I, can- I don't have time to train somebody. It's like, that's the whole reason why you need to train somebody. Yeah, exactly. Uh, or that's the reason why you hire somebody who's trained and be willing to pay more. Because like that, that's the other side of it is either you hire somebody and train them and accept that, or you find somebody who knows their stuff, you pay them more. And this is the role that they want is to be a planner. Yeah. Let's take it back to Twitter. What are some of your goals for like the next six months, next year and beyond on Twitter specifically? Yeah. So it becomes uh, hard because I don't want to be the person who's only focused on impressions and followers, right? Because like, but but what I will say is that most months where I'm getting good amounts of new prospects, it shows in the numbers. Like my followers are going up quite a bit. My impressions are above a million. And so like, basically I go back to 2021. I did like little over a million total in that whole year on Twitter. Last year, I'll have done just under 9 million. So my goal this year will probably be like 15 million impressions. I think that's like a pretty good growth wise. And then I would like to double my following. So I hit set my goal is 7,500 by the end of the year. I hit 7,500 on Jan 2nd. So I was pretty close. The goal will be that I'll be at 15,000. You know, I don't know if I'll get there or not, but like as you grow, you typically get more followers a month as you know, that gets pushed out more. So I'd say those are there. And I think the goal would be that like, I'm getting at least four prospects a month in the door that are qualified from Twitter. If that's going to be my main channel, because my big goal this year, like last year at the start of the year, my lowest model was 200 bucks a month. But then by the middle of the year, we got up to 350 by Q3, it was 450. And now my average client coming on is a little over 600 a month. And so they're more complex. So in just all reality, I I could probably take two or three a month, definitely not four, even with a CFP behind me who's helping do a lot of the work. So the goal would be basically like, hey, you get four a month, you convert three of them and you build this really awesome business. Because then my thought is at at that scale, in one to two years, I'll be at capacity, even with two full-time people around me. And then I'll just do financial plans because that's the other part of it that like doesn't get talked about. I can have this whole ongoing model and I can take on, you know, one financial plan a month at $6,500. That's an additional 80 K that's a full-time hire paid for. And that full-time hire will do most of the work besides half the meetings that I'll do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, courses, speaking engagements, all of those type of things. And it's just thinking through like, what do I want beyond that? So I also know I don't want to just like be at capacity and just, be a financial planner. Like I love building, like I really love building, but I also love the freedom that I have too. So I guess for your business, that's what one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking was, so I get your business goal is not just to hit capacity and then coast. I'm trying to figure out, do you want to grow, 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 or do you want to more like a lifestyle business? I, I can't, I'll be honest and say, I don't know. Like, I just like, I look back four years ago and I didn't want to be a business owner. So like, I just don't pretend to know what three to four years from now I'll for sure want. And regardless, the name of the game is hit capacity. So I'm going to do that. And then what's going to happen is clients are going to fall off. Like my half, mm-hmm. like maybe like 50% of my clients account for about 20% of the revenue. And then the other 50% account for 80 So those people will probably fall off. I'll hand them to a different advisor or something. And I'll basically keep filling up my book with higher income, higher complexity, higher fee clients. And in a subscription model, you're going to lose clients every year because they think that their life is more simple or things like that. But that's also why I made the shift to business owners and equity comp is because there's big decisions that need to be made every single year. And just because you're learning doesn't mean that you're able to do all of those on your own. And again, we talked about this earlier of like outsourcing, spending your time where it's best spent. Almost all my business owners understand and think of me as an employee. They say, hey, you are like our cheapest employee, cheapest part-time employee that adds a significant amount of value and takes a lot off our plate. Why would we drop you? Like we have, somebody has to fill that role. I don't have the time. We're, you know, multi-million dollar revenue business. That's not where my time is best spent. And so it seems like a really good market for us to be in. And it's not that competitive. There's not that many planners who really are doing great work with 30-year-olds making a great amount of money running a business that know nothing about the finances. I think you're an example of someone who is making the right moves in the right place with the right people. And I don't want it to make it sound like, oh, the stars just magically align for you. No, no, no you had to do stuff. <laughs> so it kind of feels like it. Yeah. Like sometimes I feel like I look back and I'm like, 
I don't know if I just got lucky. Like I, I don't pretend that maybe I did, maybe didn't and lucky timing and, and things worked out. Like I won't pretend that I didn't do the work on the marketing side or, or ever make excuses and not do it. But like, I, I mean, I look back and I don't feel like I like did anything extravagant or did anything that hard. I just did what I thought I should do and not really anything above that. Well, it's just one of those things like, are you lucky to be alive in 2023? Yes. Are you lucky to be born in America in this time? Yes. To in, in an era in which like computers exist and Twitter exists. Like if you were born 50 years ago, you wouldn't be able to use Twitter. It's just one of those things. But there are a whole bunch of other people who are born in America, who are alive during this time, who have access to Twitter, who don't get the results that you get. So it, it's both, to be honest, or at least I think it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't know. I, it, it, it's worked out really well. I always have like, you always have the fear in the back of your mind. Like is all of a sudden, is that going to go away? Like I went two weeks at the start of this year without a prospect. And I was like, man, is my content bad? Like what is going on? And then literally in the last 24 hours, I've gotten six. And it's just like, that's how it works. Like there's just no arguing the fact that like there's ebbs and flows. You're going to be worried. There's going to be good. There's going to be bad. And not every month is going to be the best. And sometimes you're going to lose a client because they don't understand your value and they don't use you in the right way. And other times every client's going to be raving about you. And that's part of the journey. I view it like investing. So investing, it's like you dollar cost average. And oh, if you chart it on a graph, it looks like a linear return, but you're buying above the line and you're buying below the line. Well, you have reversion to the mean and a moving average with business building as well. You're going to have some months that suck a little bit more and some months that suck a little bit less. And yeah. you just grow over time. And a so lot of sucky cool months see. early on too, right? Like, I mean, the, the excuse I always hear from financial planners is that marketing doesn't work. And like, everybody says like, oh, you're one of the best in the industry at doing this. It still took me a year of consistent content before I really got any okay leads. And they were okay leads. It took me about two years before I started to get really good types of clients through it. And most advisors just give up. They say it's not working, blah, blah, blah. And, and like, think about it. That's with me doing a ton of posting. Like if you post every Monday, Wednesday, Friday on LinkedIn, and then you have vacation a week every once in a while, and then someday you're busy, like think about that. That's even if every week you did 12 a month, 70 posts. And you think you're like over three months, you think in like, I don't know, 30 posts that you're all of a sudden going to be getting all these clients. Like that's just not how it works. Yeah. Are there any advisors that you can think of or any advisor business styles that would not be successful on Twitter? I, I think that if you go to a, an older audience, I, I can see the argument. I actually still have a lot of followers that are older, that are like 50s and 60s that engage with me, even though I'm not the right client. So I still think people live there. I mean, I just think like if they're business owners, if they're millennials, if they're in tech, if they're in sales, if they're in health and fitness, like... Almost all of those, like I had somebody tell me like, Hey, I work with chiropractors that seems like they're only on Instagram. And it's like, I don't know how you can just say that. Like, I don't know how you could say like 30 and 40 old chiropractors are just on Instagram. Cause I have chiropractor clients that found me from Twitter. Like that there's a lot of them just because 60% are here and 40% here doesn't mean it's easier to grab that 60%, right? Like just that platform might not be easier. Like I look at some people I know that create on Instagram and that's their main channel they've been putting out hundreds of videos and they have like 700 followers on there. Like if you're, if your network isn't growing, you can only nurture those same people so many times before you realize that they're probably not going to be ones to buy. Yeah. And you don't have to be limited to just one platform either, because as we talked about earlier, you you can put something on LinkedIn and then you can repurpose to Twitter or vice versa. So if someone is on Instagram, they can just as easily, or not just as easily, but with a little bit more effort, disproportionately less effort, go to Twitter and make but, it work and find the people there. Exactly. And let's say Instagram, you're like, well, like words don't really work that well. So I'm going to do a reel, right? I'm going to do a minute long reel. Well, you had to think of the content that reel beforehand. You probably even wrote an outline or did it. Why isn't that reel a thread? Like, and why is it? And then why don't you post that reel as, as a shorter video? And then why don't you cut up that thread into three to five points that you had in there? Like those are all no brainers, easy thing to do when you're already thinking about it. And it really wouldn't take that much more time. And even if it does take more time, it's, it's part of your job. Like, yeah, you, you get, you get paid to do it or at least indirectly. Yeah. yeah. I have two more questions for you. The last one is going to be, how can people get in touch with you? But I really want to know if you could go back to day one on your Twitter account, knowing everything that you know today, what are like two or three things you would tell yourself, like the the most important things 
as you get started? Number one, would it be I'd focus on the hook first and foremost, because like you can have an amazing post and an amazing thread, but if, if like people scroll Twitter, they just kind of summarize. And if they don't get interested, they're going past it. So it doesn't matter how great that content is grabbing attention. And, and that's where like Samantha Russell really helped me on that. Like she, we talked about a few things. She's like, Hey, here's like, I was like, can you give me advice on what I'm doing? Like what I could be better. And she's like, you got to focus in on the first line. Th- that's it. You have the first in the first line on LinkedIn to Twitter to whatever, because if you're just like, like I, I talk to advisors all the time and I had a conversation with a guy the other day and he was like, you know, I started posting on LinkedIn and like, I just don't know. I've been getting very much traction. I'm like, let me guess what your, one of your first posts were. You said, HSAs are great tax. Advantage. Yes, yes. This, this, and this. And I'm like, that's yep. not interesting. If you that's saw exactly that, right. would you do it? You might start it with more like, you might get, you might have no clue what the most tax advantage account that exists are. Maybe you guess Roth IRAs. Maybe you guess traditional IRAs. Maybe you guess your 401k. You're wrong. It's an HSA. Here's why. Like that, people are going to read that, right? Like, and if you, and if you skip those and you just go, here's an HSA, nobody's reading, right? So like that, that would be, First and foremost, my main focus, I think another one would be like, I would never post links. I I definitely used to like, Hey, here's my blog post. Go to there. Nobody's leaving there. And it would get like 95 views, like, and then they wouldn't even click it. So it wouldn't even matter. I would follow people who have really good content, other industries, because if we look in our industry, archaic, right? Like, I mean, most content's bad. Most videos, bad, most just in general, not very good. There's other industries that are way farther ahead. So what are those industries? Who are those best creators in that space? And like, I'll see somebody's post and I'll be like, that's a great framework. And I could talk about investing with that. And then I'll go Mm -hmm. use that framework and do it because like everybody's like, well, then that's stealing. It's like, you've never said anything original that hasn't been put out there anyways. Like you, you haven't. So there's nothing wrong with doing that. So I would say like, those would be my three main focuses. I guess the fourth one would be scheduling. Like people are like, well, then if I schedule, I can't be as real time about things. It's like, yes, you can just then tweet those real time things in that day. But at least that guarantees you have income. I mean, not income guarantees that you have posts out there. Cause every advisor is like, I get busy. I stop. It's like, how do you, how do you overcome that? You schedule, right? Like that, that's the solution. So that would be like, what my main focuses would be going into it. And those were just things that I learned by failing. And the, the machine does the hard work for you. I think I would be super lazy. I would follow people in other industries, just like you said, and look at the framework. And if I saw a strong hook, and this is based on what you told me, because again, I'm not super active on Twitter. My Twitter sucks. Um, so nobody follow me for Twitter advice at all. But <laughs> But I would look at these hooks and I would go to something like chat GPT and I'd be like, generate 10 similar hook ideas. I wouldn't have to be creative or anything. I've been trying. I've been trying that. And one chat GPT, like half the days doesn't let me on because it's at full, which always stinks. I was trying to like write a blog post today and I was like, wanted to part from it, but then always rewrite it, right? Like you like take it and kind of rewrite it and make your own. But like, even if that doesn't give you the one you post, it gets you stuck out of the mental words that keep coming, right? Because sometimes you're like, I can't think of anything else. And so then it gives you other options. Maybe you don't like, but it changes some words that you can now flow through it better. Yeah. I have been doing a lot of experimenting. And what's interesting is a lot of the the AI stuff I'm going to be using outside of the financial services industry. And like financial advisors won't see these businesses, but it's some very, very powerful stuff. And there have been tools. I think it's Hype Fury. I I know there's a couple other ones. I use Hype Fury. Yeah. I, so Hype Fury is, has like the automatic generator where you type in a keyword and it generates like 10 ideas or something. Like I haven't used it for that. Like when I'm scheduling, it'll pull old tweets of mine. So sometimes that will give me there. I can go view all of my best tweets. I can, there's inspiration. So there might be like fitness and you can pull up oh, that's a right. bunch of top ones and you can look through it. I schedule through there. I could set it where I'm like, Hey, I just released this great download, blah, blah, blah in the comments do this and if, and i can set it so like if they comment that word it auto dms them for giving them that thing i don't use it i know cody garrett's used it for that i know travis gatsmeyer's used it for that like i just don't do that many downloads or, or giveaways not for any specific reason i just basically just give it all away and because i think the more that i gate the less people are going to go to it and if it's driving so much business as is I, for now i just won't change it yeah but i think it is a good structure working. Yeah, I wouldn't stop what's working. I would keep doing what you're doing. So this episode is scheduled to come out in April. We're recording in January and you have just shy of 8,000 followers, I believe, when I looked. 
your goal is to get to 15,000. I would, I'm thinking you, you might hit 15,000 by the time this episode comes out. So we'll see people, people will listen that. and they'll be, they'll pull up your profile and they'll be able to see, they'll be able to see the numbers. I, would, and see the I just hope I would love to be at 10. That'd be good. Crossing five figures would feel good. I feel I like, I, I remember when I started, I saw people like three or four and I was like, that's crazy. And then like, you know, a couple of my clients have like in the tens and I'm like, dang, that's crazy. And then I have like people, other people I work with or like, you know, do podcasts with, and they're in like the hundreds and, you know, that picked up over time. And I just hope that like mine is, you know, kind of that exponential growth because, you know, that's how you really kind of get a lot. Yeah. I, I don't regret where I am today. Like I went hard with email and online ads and everything. And obviously it worked out well for me, (laughs) but I, 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 I'm interested. I want to play on Twitter a little bit more. The biggest fear that I've had, you kind of squashed in the beginning of our conversation, and that is the content curation. Uh, I just am so paranoid and so like not afraid, but just like I'm so guarded of my mental state. Like I want to be clear. I want to be positive. I want to be accurate at all times. I don't want to be influenced by someone like, oh, my Starbucks coffee was cold and today's going to be a terrible day. I don't want to see it. I don't want to be near it. I don't want to even get it in my environment. I don't want to take, and that's why I don't take the chance, but I, I, you have inspired me. I think I'm going to do a little bit more or at least try yeah, to. But also like you might've made the right choice. Cause what if this whole Twitter fiasco goes down and then I'm like, man, where am I going to start building now? Email, mm-hmm. you can at least control that. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. This has been a great show. I'm glad that we finally got to talk about Twitter marketing on the financial advisor marketing podcast. How can people find you if they want to learn more? Yeah, definitely Twitter. I'm um, T. Copelman on there. And then LinkedIn is just Thomas Copelman. And the one thing I do is I do monthly office hours for advisors. I actually just did one this morning. Reach out or look on my profile. I, I actually have a newsletter to subscribe to. I don't email anybody, but I just let them know when those office hours are. And I've done two. I have like 70 advisors on it right now. And the goal is that we can come in, people can ask me questions, and we can all learn together. That's pretty cool. It's awesome to see somebody like sharing with financial advisors. Like, here's what I'm doing. Here's what works. Here's what didn't work. Like, just through the show. And office hours, that's an awesome opportunity for people. Exactly. All right. So financial advisors, I hope you enjoyed this episode all about Twitter marketing. If you're on Twitter, make sure you follow Thomas. Make sure you go to LinkedIn. Follow him on LinkedIn as well, where you can see his tweets that he's going to repurpose, which is a great idea, by the way. And With that said, I will catch you next week. This is the podcastfactory.com.